Hello, 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 hello. Welcome everyone to the Gamma Sutra Twitch channel. My name is Bryant Francis. As always, the uh, invisible voice inside your head. Um, I am here today with uh, two wonderful faces in the lower left-hand corner of the screen um, to play a little game called Tacoma. Alex, first of the faces, would you please introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, hey, uh, I'm still here with you, Brian. My name is Alex Huaro. I am an editor at Gamasutra.com, and I am the less interesting of the two faces here in the corner. We have a very <laughs> interesting guest who has been kind enough to join us today. Um, mystery guest, could you maybe do us the favor of telling the audience who you are and what you do? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Nina Freeman. I'm one of the level designers at Fulbright who worked on Tacoma. Um, and I've done a bunch of other stuff, um, sort of on my own, smaller personal projects, games like Sybil and How Do You Do It. Um, most recently, LostMemories.net, which I made for the Manchester International Festival. So I'm a game developer, level designer, narrative game um, lover. Uh, so that's me, and I'm psyched to chat a little bit about Tacoma. It's my first Tacoma stream since it has come out, so I'm really psyched. I, I want to get to like some introductory questions about the game. Tacoma is a narrative adventure game set in a space station. Um, uh, uh, but, but before I get into the sort of introductory broader questions, I want to ask, um, this is the first time on a spaceship that I've like turned around from like the starting area and encountered like this kind of... Uh, wood like this is just wood paneling on a spaceship here like this is strangely blowing my mind right now could you sort of <laughs> like, do you know anything why about why like i guess this is an ai enclosure but why this yeah. kind of cargo boxy looking setup is the first thing players see when they turn around sure yeah so right now we're in amy's ship amy is the protagonist um sort of you know the player character um and she basically you know, you don't know all this yet because, you know, you're kind of thrown into the game um, and you learn this about her in the beginning. Basically, she's a contractor who's been hired by uh, the Venturis Corporation um, to come to Tacoma and retrieve some data for them, retrieve an AI that's been left there. Um, so you're a contractor and that ship that you just exited um, was the ship that she came in on. So it's like her contractor ship that was sort of like set up, you know, sort of for a last minute contractor trip to be set up to retrieve this AI, which is why you have like all those, yeah, like wood panels. Cause it's just sort of supposed to be like, you know, uh, I'm like, what's the word? Is the word slap shot, slip shot? Slap shot, slip shot, <laughs> slip shot, yeah, slip shot. yeah, that's the word. And it's just supposed to be like, you know, a basic contractor set up just to be like, okay, okay, you like go do this thing. Like she doesn't have like, she's not an official Venturist employee or anything. She's a contractor who's just been sent out sort of on this, this small mission. Um, so she doesn't have the most glamorous setup or anything, um, but she's sort of here to just kind of get the job done and, and get out. Um, so that's sort of her little her little um, shit that she's been sent off by the Ventures Corporation on. So it's kind of a way. I mean, it's kind of the first first way we can illustrate right as the game gets started is how you you all are using level design to communicate information about the character and her place in the world. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. It's definitely. We wanted to have Amy's ship feel different from the main Tacoma station because, like I said, she's not a Venturis employee. You know, she's been sort of sent there for this mission for them as a contractor, and we wanted to sort of show the contrast between here's like this official Venturis facility that's like, you know, all decked out for people really living in and in this space in space uh, for an extended period of time versus a contractor who's been sent out for a short-term mission. Um, and who's like, you know, not supposed to be out like living in this in her small ship. She's supposed to kind of go there and leave. Um, so definitely diff trying to differentiate Amy's space from the crew's space. Right on. Could we talk um, just for a second here about your own um, work as a game developer and the story of how you came to be involved in this project? I think that's a really interesting Thing to delve into uh have you ever worked with a team like this before or has it always been mostly solo work um yeah it's been so before i started at fulbright i was a student actually so i went to pace university was an english literature major not really planning to go into games at all did poetry and then kind of fell into a group of friends like a friend group in new york and a bunch of them were game designers and i just kind of was like oh you make games i love games that's cool and discovered 
game making that way and started going to game jams and stuff with them and started working on little small things just for fun like with friends always with like groups so like for example how do you do it was like one of those early early games that i worked on with my friends and that was four of us um so most of the work i'd done before fulbright was like on like tiny teams like that and mostly in like sort of a friend circumstance where none of us were trying to like build a company out of it or anything we were just kind of like let's make this as friends um, until Sybil, which was a bit more of like uh, an official thing that I was doing um, where I like gathered a team and like, you know, we sold the game and whatever. So that's a little different, but yeah, prior to Fulbright, I hadn't worked at a game studio at all. I had just been doing kind of like independent solo work with friends um, or grad school work, which is what Sybil was. It was started as like my master's thesis project. Um, and then I met Steven Carla and then I started working at Fulbright after we chatted and were friends for a while and talked about games together. Steve gave me a lot of feedback on Sybil. Um, so we kind of got to know each other as designers through that. Um, long story short, <laughs> basically. Nice. Yeah, and it nice. sounds like you're still working with a group of friends. Um, but sort of like uh, kind of what I want to dig into is, um, you know, you are, you are pitched on this project as a level designer. I'm sure you had input on a bunch of different stuff and, and worked collaboratively with everybody. But I want to know what it was like to try and come into a project that had already been established, had a certain kind of creative vibe, creative vision, and try to work within that to um, like surface those values and your own values through the level design. Yeah. Yeah, so when when I like interviewed at Fulbright for the job I now have, um, they had started, Tacoma had been in development a bit. Like there was, it was a, a completely different game back then. Um, I think it was set in space at that point. There was a point where Tacoma was set on Earth. <laughs> so like it's gone through a very like large, it's grown a lot since they started mm. um, or since we started. Um, and so yeah, I was hired when they were trying to build the team. So they hadn't really like, the game wasn't in full development yet when I was interviewed. So I actually got to start really at a very formative time in the project when we at least like Carla and Steve sort of had the setting, like we're gonna be on the space station with this crew and it's really gonna be about them. Um, so yeah, I actually got to start, you know, during the really, really early phases before Tacoma, the Tacoma station was like this, like when it was still sort of more of a luxury space. Mm. Um, I think originally the plan was to have Tacoma be like a luxury kind of waypoint between a resort and earth uh a resort on the moon mm -hmm. um and tacoma was super different back then and so i was working on it in that early time and actually got to be a part of like it changing into what it has now become um when we kind of like made a shift in focus um which is sort of a long story but basically uh, oh yeah right there brian how's it going uh the bug <laughs> showed up again i'll go fix this while you guys keep chatting yeah, yeah nobody, nobody the game's gonna vanish sorry about this nobody panic uh there's there's a there's a mild uh, uh issue we have with our streaming setup where we're occasionally losing uh controller connection so it's no big deal uh <laughs> we're just gonna we're just gonna we're gonna take care of that uh i'm sorry nina go ahead no, uh tell okay. me a bit about... i was like just talking without even looking at the screen so i was like oh hey <laughs> That's okay. I mean, this is uh, uh, ostensibly an interview show. That's cool. Um, I uh, uh, We should dig into that a little bit because I think that's one of the, um, the persistently interesting parts of Tacoma's story is the sort of like the the pause and revamp, right? Somewhere in 2015, I think, maybe, um, you know, like the game kind of changed in a big way. Yeah. And uh, what was that like for you? I didn't realize, forgive me, that you were involved um, so early in the project. So what was it like? Um, putting in all that work, taking it out for playtests, and then deciding, you know, maybe this isn't right. This isn't what we're trying to do. This isn't like really sort of what we want to put out. Yeah, it was it was interesting because um, yeah, we had built this full version of the game um, with like a couple of pretty large spaces and uh, a handful of like really early versions of these AR scenes that are now in the game. Um, and, you know, we sent it out for a big play test and we're getting this feedback that basically communicated to us that, like, some of our ideas were getting across about what this game was, but not all of them. Mm. It's kind of big, but it, it's super because this was the early version. And I think one of the things we focused in on was, like, we had these scenes that were taking place in 3D space, 
but it like wasn't really those scenes weren't engaging people in the way that we wanted them to and at that point in development we had like more low gravity spaces so a lot of the mechanics were like you jump from one surface to another and that like both surfaces are different areas you can explore mm -hmm. and that meant like the levels were huge um and those it was like hard to really make those spaces feel as personal also because there was just like so much space um so we were like we were like what we are what we feel like we're good at is like making these personal spaces making these like character driven stories like we feel like there's a lot of potential for these scenes that like the ar scenes that were not really interactive yet so we kind of took all that feedback and took a step back and we're like we should reevaluate what we're doing so that we can better communicate like the story in the ways that we're really strong at. So that's when Stephen Carla kind of came up with the AR scenes being more interactive. So like, you know, in, in the game now you can scrub through the AR scenes as if they're videos. Um, that idea kind of sprung out of the, the shift we took in development um, and the whole idea of like having one zero, zero G space and then having the personal spaces all of gravity that stuff all kind of came to fruition at that point too, because we were really like, we should start playing to our strengths again, because <laughs> I think we kind of lost track of that for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so it was really good. We definitely threw out a lot of stuff, which was, you know, that's not always the most fun thing, but it was totally, totally worth it. Um, and I think the game became a lot better for it, so. Yeah, no, totally. I, um, so I, uh, uh, Steve was kind enough to chat with us like two weeks ago um, ahead of the game's release about this whole uh, production story. And I thought uh, you know, the way he pitched it was like uh, the, the game had gone out to play testers and some of the feedback that, that came back was like, okay, how are you going? This is cool. This is great. How are you going to make it different from Gone Home? And mm -hmm. his, his point to me was like, well, if you have to ask that question, then clearly we're doing something wrong, right? Like something, th this needs to be self-evident. Yeah. Uh, and so, like, part of what he described is, like, in, in a way, it 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 got much farther from Gone Home, and and uh, in, in in terms of like the the interactive uh, cinematics that you can scrub back and replay and move through, um, it's very much like interactive theater. And in some ways, it became more like Gone Home, and that like those free floating segments kind of were brought back down to earth in a way. And now you can sort of move through spaces and rival through people's stuff and look at their notes and everything. Um, for you as a level designer, like, what did that mean for you to kind of pull back on the like zero g stuff and figure out ways to tell stories through like objects resting on tables you know like like how did how did you change your approach to design to accommodate that's like shift in direction yeah um i mean i think honestly giving ourselves the benefit of gravity made things a lot easier because <laughs> mm -hmm. we didn't have to worry about like how do we because in zero gravity like things are just gonna float right and we were really like that's fun and we still have that in the game mm -hmm. but like i think we really enjoy doing the stuff like for example the dinner table in admin where it has like all the party hats and stuff right that's like you know you can pick all that stuff up and whatever but you know when you first encounter it it's this sort of like whole set piece um and you can kind of like look, look at it and be like oh what was happening at this table I guess it probably has to do with this obsolescence day party which I just saw signed for um, and all that stuff kind of being organized in a really specific way um, you know I think is important to communicating a story there and if like those things were just kind of like floating around it would be a little more confusing to the player I think like we would know what was going on but like mm. the player wouldn't necessarily know if things were just kind of like randomly there so I think yeah. I'm sure there's ways to do it well with like that kind of site like we had considered doing something like velcro like having things velcroed down and like that stuff like that they really do on like the iss but um i think it was just getting to be like we were spending way too much time thinking about how to enable ourselves to do that kind of storytelling and we were like we can just use gravity and it'll be fine <laughs> so um so yeah it was nice to be able to like get back to you know, thinking about how we really do set things up in the real world and like people are so familiar with that kind of thing that it's like the ideas just come across so much faster. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that kind of transparency, I think, really helps, you know, the player 
go through the story in a way that feels clear to them and to understand things without getting caught up in the details. Like they can just kind of take it in at their own pace, which is important to us. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I'd love to sort of pull apart the, um, the, the conversation mechanics in more detail, right? Because like something I'm really impressed by that uh, Tacoma does is uh, it gives the player more options, uh, more things to do, more mechanics to play with from a first person perspective. That's not just like shooting and ducking, you know, which I think is, has always been a um, like a real hang up for first person game designers is like, how do you give the player meaningful things to do in the world? That's not just, you know, causing destruction or avoiding it. Uh, and I'm going to I'm gonna loop this in. There's a question in the chat from Eric Mahler. Eric asks, did you have to design your spaces differently, knowing conversations could start with large groups and split off to smaller conversations? So how did you design around um, all the different ways players are meant to interact with those 3D scenes? Sure. So, yay, the game's back. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's see. So it's, it is kind of interesting. Um, so the like the order of how we built these things is funny. So I actually did the paper maps for the spaces we're in right now, or like the original sort of like level layouts. So like literally, you know, the shapes of the rooms and like the way things connect and 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 whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I was doing that really early before the scenes were even done being written, because you know we we're a small studio, so we only had so much time to work on this game. So we were like, you know doing a lot at once all the time right. um, so the level layouts just so we could get people playing in the space were happening really early on um so Listen, when i was designing like these two wings we're in operations right now and the other one across the way is a, a, um, admin um when i was doing those as level designer like my focus was less on the details of the scene and more of what actually would be in these spaces to make this this wing feel realistic and feel like useful to the crew and like why are they going there what rooms will the player expect there to be in a wing named operations for example um so like you know the operations guy is clive he's dealing with a lot of like shipment stuff and i knew you know a lot about the characters at this point um so i was like okay so he's shipping stuff out so there's probably going to be cargo bay um, operations stuff, like, we can have the gym there, because that's a lot of, like, equipment-related stuff, um, and obviously there's, like, the locker rooms, and it's just, like, they're, like, storing a lot of things there, um, and obviously Clive is the operations guy, so his bunk is gonna be there, and his office is gonna be there, so a lot of the early level design stuff for these areas was just, like, trying to think about how to make a realistic space that feels lived in, that feels usable by the crew. Um, and then, as Steve and Carlo were writing the AR scenes, they worked with Noel, the animator, to stage them in the space to make sense there. Um, so it was really, like, actually pretty interdisciplinary, like, working a lot with Noel and Steve and Carla and, like, all this stuff kind of happening at once and coming together as a full piece pretty simultaneously. Huh. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a, a set designer and a, and a scene writer, except the set designer is actually building the set uh, ahead of or, or right around as, as the play is being written and, and laid <laughs> yeah. out. So that's it's kind of sounds like, like, a, like a fun balancing act. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Brian, uh, you're back. Did you have any uh, pressing questions that you wanted to, to get out before we move on? Oh, um, uh, I should actually walk back. Let me just grab everything that's on this desktop real quick. I know I'm supposed to normally like pay attention to all this, but um, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, here I am breaking your game. Um, <laughs> no, well, the beauty of it is that you can play it however you want. <laughs> yeah, um, we're not stop you. <laughs> this is the wrong area. So the, there's one thing I wanted to bring up in this discussion and see what your thoughts were about it. Is um, back up here, which is the first sort of like after you get your first AR conversation, then you can start splitting off to explore your room. Is a terminal where uh, if this thing just sort of finishes on its own, um, uh, you could literally just like load this thing in, stand here for three hours, and my understanding is the game will come to an end. Like that'll fulfill the game's main objective. Um, yes. What's your take on that? Like like we're standing here right now, in theory, you could spend the entire stream standing here, and if that wouldn't trigger that nasty bug we just saw. Um, yeah. <laughs> it would uh, end the game. Um, so what is, while we're still here, what's your take on it? And how do you think that effect? I mean, it's weird to say, how does the thing where the player literally just stands still affect your work when your work is making places for players to walk? <laughs> but that is the question. So 
Yeah, I'm glad you're asking me this. I, I was really, really heavily involved in the development of that specific part of the game, which we call the sync device. Yeah. Um, so early on in development, when we were playtesting actually these specific areas, because these were like the first areas um, of the game that we had for playtesters, um, we did not have that sync device yet. And basically we had more like locks and keys at that point and like passwords and stuff that would let you explore different rooms. Mm -hmm. We found during those play tests that like a lot of these codes were found on desktops, like the one you're looking at now. Mm -hmm. And players were really like, we found that they were actually kind of ignoring what was happening in the scene and just like trying to find the codes without even really like thinking about what was going on. They were just like, okay, I'm looking for that thing to pop up in the world that will give me the key so I can look at the next cool area. And we were kind of like, okay, so we're basically incentivizing the player to ignore like our AR scenes because they you can't really find you don't find codes like in the character moving around right like that's just like story stuff that we want you to engage with. So we were like we're kind of like with the old way we were doing it. We were like we're distracting the player from what we want them to be paying attention to. So we were like okay, how do we still have some gating so that players can't just like go literally everywhere at once so we can like you know, have things in a specific order without having them want to just scrub these AR scenes for keys. Um, so after that conversation, we brainstormed and kind of came up with this idea of the sync device where, yes, there's one way you can finish the game, which is by sitting in front of it and watching it tick up to 100%. But if you go explore the wings, it goes faster. So we were like, that is a more abstract way that isn't tied. It isn't the sync device is sort of so abstractly tied to these AR scenes that it helped players sort of like relax for a second and be like, okay, I'm just waiting for this download like I might be uploading things off my flash drive or whatever and lets them kind of like explore the wing at their leisure rather than worrying like, oh, I got to look at the scene to find the code because otherwise I can't finish the game. Um, we wanted something a little more like that would help the player feel relaxed enough to just explore and not worry about the gating so explicitly, if that makes sense. So that was sort of the, the idea, um, a short version of the idea behind the sync device. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I wonder, uh, in talking about, you know, asking players to move through these spaces and come to know these characters and their stories, like, uh, how did you deal with the problem of making these characters relatable and meaningful? Like, I think back to to Gone Home and like that that game trades a lot on things that a lot of people consider nostalgic uh, you know like uh, like girl, girl Rock and, and, and old houses in the Pacific Northwest and pizza and, and all it's the stuff, stuff that like a lot of kids remember <laughs> like tapes of the X-Files you know like I remember pizza <laughs> <laughs> yeah so like uh, I wonder like how do you uh, how do you make spaces like this feel warm human and relatable when it's like a weird, crazy space station in the future. Sure. Yeah, that definitely, you know, uh, especially like a lot of the, so Steve and Carla are sort of the ones that really wrote the story. And Steve was like the writer and Carla is his editor and they really work together and are like the authors of the story and are, you know, so they were the ones who were sort of like defining the characters early on and stuff. And Although we're a small studio, so we're all kind of involved in that, which is really cool. Um, like, we get to have a lot of input, so that's why I can be like, I actually know how this happened. Um, so, for them, I know, like, character comes first and foremost. Like, you can definitely see that in Gone Home, which I didn't work on, but, you know, now I know a bunch about its development just from working with them. Um, and character is always really a, a true focus for them, so... You know, with Gone Home, early on they did a lot of, like, interviews with people who had similar life experiences to those of their characters. And they also did that for Tacoma, so right from the outset, like, there's a, a focus on character, a focus on specificity of lived experiences. Um, so the writing is really coming from that. Um, and then, you know, like I was saying before, we wanted to make these, these spaces feel personal and feel lived in, because I think that that really makes the story feel that much more real especially like sort of for this kind of game like we want the player to feel like they're really here and that these characters were here and that they can get to know the story in the space where it happened especially with these ar scenes where you really are like the story is happening all around you all the time 
Um, so I think the feeling of realism is something that we really aim to achieve, whether it's from defining the characters through like, you know, doing all this research, whether it's Carla being like, uh, she's like really got into researching like space stations and how people actually live on them. And then, you know, extrapolating sort of the more futuristic elements from that. And then to Noelle, who was the animator, who really, you know, I think she did an amazing job just making the characters, like animating them to feel real, like with just little personal ticks. And like one person was commenting to us, they really liked, there's this one part later where Clive and Evie, the two in this room right now actually, are walking around holding hands and then another crew member approaches them and you can see they stop holding hands really quickly. And that kind of says something about their relationship. And that's just like a really subtle animation detail. So I think all this stuff kind of came together, I think, or we hope <laughs> to make the characters feel real to people. Yeah, right on. Uh, what do you think pizza is like in the future of Tacoma? <laughs> okay, I'm like, do we have pizza in the game? Now I'm freaking out. Um, <laughs> we need Pop pizza. quiz. Um, we have actually, I mean, there's a lot of food on Tacoma. Mm -hmm. Like if you go, especially in the admin wing, um, or like there's the oolong tea right there. Uh, part of my drink bag. Yeah. The drink Ooh. bags, the drink bags are actually one of the few things in the game that has been in it since that first version that we like kind of threw away. We've mm -hmm. always had the drink bags. <laughs> They're gross. <laughs> but you know, like I've been saying, we want to make these spaces feel real. We're aiming for a, a sense of realism. Yeah. And so, like, having stuff like food around is really important for that because, like, people are eating. People have snacks around. Nat's bunk or Nat's office is full of, like, granola bar wrappers and, like, empty uh, cups of ramen noodles that she just has lying around because, like, she's just that kind of person that will just leave her, like, food trash lying around her office. Um, and so that kind of stuff is important, just the little details, even if they're not super plot relevant, we like to have yeah. a lot of that stuff, um, to make it feel like people were there. Nice. Um, I'm going to just have a brief moment of, I understood, like, I just wandered over here, realized there was another area, I was about to turn back, and I looked at this poster and I had a, I understood that reference moment, because this is, um, a Midsummer Night's Dream, but, I don't know, just like, I'm suddenly struck by, like, uh, how do you think... We're, Alex asked a question earlier about nostalgia. How do you think uh, references can be used well in game design? Because there's sort of like the difference between a very obvious pop culture reference, like someone dropping in, like, I'm your father, and yeah. this. This is, But this is like an older reference than that. This is literally like a play referencing Greek mythology from the 15th, 16th century. Um, yeah. Don't quote me on that. Um, and I was just at Shakespeare on Sunday. Like, how do you feel cultural references and nostalgia impact game design? And maybe how do they impact level design? Yeah. I mean, this that topic is definitely super important to me, like, because of a lot of my personal work. I'm, like, using a lot of, like, nostalgia stuff. Um, and for me, this, you know, know actually, this even goes farther back to when I was working in poetry. Yeah. And in the poetry world in the kind of poetry I was looking at and I was inspired by, so a lot of like 80s New York poets, 70s and 80s, they were writing a lot about their daily lives. And, you know, pop culture is happening all around us all the time. Like, culture is happening all around us all the time. And we, even the way we talk to each other, like in daily life, I think we just make a lot of references to like things that are happening in the world, whether it's politics or movies or whatever. So I think a part of like ordinary daily life speech involves a lot of references like that really naturally. So I think writing characters that feel real, like I think you kind of need to acknowledge that sort of thing, that that sort of thing is really a part of like language and a part of our daily lives. So I think it's like less about, I mean, I love like nostalgic stuff like that's just nostalgic for nostalgic sake. But I think for us, it's just like part of making these characters feel like real people, making them feel like they're living in a world that, you know, has sort of this ambient culture that maybe isn't explicitly in the game every second, but that the player feels like it's there, like they do live in this world. Um, so yeah, I think those kinds of references that bring people down to earth and remind them that like they're people um, is really important. Um, or you can go like, I did that lostmemories.net game recently that's really, for me, was just like, I want to get nostalgic about 2000's internet. 
<laughs> I, uh, so yeah, I, I get uh, I, <laughs> into I, that world. So you can be on lots of ends of the spectrum, but I think it's a good one. <laughs> Sorry. We, Here we go again. I'll be right back. Nice. Uh, oh. we, we need to we need to look into lostmemories.net. I know that that recently came out. That was a, a commission, right? That was by uh, a British museum. Am I crazy? Did I just uh, make that up? Mr. International Festival. Oh. Oh, it's like an arts festival that happens every couple of years in uh, in the UK in Manchester. Oh, all right. Well, my bad. Uh, that sounds uh, rad, and it sort of like begs the question of how do you, as a practicing indie game designer, like balance the demands of having. Uh, what you might consider a full-time job with a studio with your own continued creative output. Like, mm-hmm. how do you deal with that as a human being? <laughs> yeah. It's hard. I don't even know. Um, yeah, it's kind of wild. I shipped four games while I was working on Tacoma. Um, so I actually just, like, work way too much. <laughs> There's not really much of it. I don't really have any wise words about it. I just have always been someone who thrives on like having multiple things to put my energy into especially because like I feel like if I get too too focused and too too deep on one project without separating myself from it every once in a while then like I can't like do my best work on it like I kind of need that distance Mm. um, or I need to like kind of check in and check out every once in a while so that I can like keep having new ideas for it without getting too burnt out so I think some of it for me is like needing variety to feel at my best creative self um so yeah i always work on a lot of stuff at once but right now i actually like we ship tacoma and i like don't have any side projects right now for a minute so Mm -hmm. it feels kind of (laughs) good all right so like uh in this in this moment in this pause between uh workloads like i want to ask what do you give up for that you know like i think a lot of designers deal with this um, you know, they, they give up family, they give up sleep, they give up uh, exercise to uh, fulfill their creative passions. Like, I want to know, what is it for you that you sacrifice to do this kind of work? Um, let's see. I think, well, like, well, one of the things about making games is that, like, they're so, like, the amount of work that goes into a game of the scale of Tacoma or even of the scale of, like, Sybil mm-hmm. is just, like, immense. Um, I think you could work on one of these games forever and never feel like it's perfect, you know, like games are just kind of one of the, or it's like even the same, I think probably with illustration or something like you can work on your piece forever, you know, you can always be making it better. So one of the things that like you have to deal with is like being able to cut yourself off from your work at a certain point and to like be happy with like finishing it and just being like, okay. Like, I don't need to work on this anymore. So I think one of the challenges is, like, dealing with that kind of attachment to projects and, like, being able to kind of let go of things. And a lot of that is, like, maintaining hobbies and stuff like that. So I, for a while, I found myself, like, not really having many hobbies other than just, like, working on side projects. And I was, Mm -hmm. like, probably not very healthy. Um, so then I got like super into Overwatch and I play that like all the time. That's so pretty good. Uh, like, uh, I recommend Player Unknown's Battlegrounds as a good hobby as well. What is? Sorry. Uh, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds is an excellent <laughs> hobby as well. Uh, I love that game. My computer isn't like super. My computer isn't super great at running it, so I haven't played it as much as I want. But mm-hmm. that game is really fun. I love it. I wonder. Um, Are we talking about hobbies? Do we yeah. come back? Yeah, hi. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> How's it um, going? Good. I have uh, I have a theory about why this keeps happening while we're playing, so I'm keeping my... Uh... Oh, man, did it wipe? How much of this... Uh, hmm. uh, I, I'm keeping the controller directly connected to the console near me and nudging on it every now and then. Nice. Oh, okay. Just pray. Um, sort of surround it in a circle of salt. Uh, Nina, I think it's really interesting that you didn't mention poetry when you talked about... Oh, no. Um, having to deal with the constant stress of of, of uh, thinking something you're making is not good enough to put out there, but realizing that you, it'll never be good enough, really. So you just have to kind of get it out and go. Um, it, was that not the same experience for you writing poetry, or was it? Uh, was it? Did, did, I guess a better question is how did um, how does writing poetry influence your work as a game designer? How has it shaped the way you work? Sure. Um, it's yeah for me. So I was doing a lot of the poetry stuff when I was still a student um, and still living in New York and whatnot. 
and that part of it is that poetry really taught me like like how do I describe this so poetry taught me everything I know about writing but also poetry taught me that you can make something tiny and just give it to people and like put it out and be done with it um because I had I had mentors that were just like that would encourage me to do that and also I was in school so like at a certain point I had to write poetry for homework for example and would have to pass it and I'd be happy with it at a certain point but beyond that when I was more doing it you know outside of the school setting um you know there's like sort of a reading culture so like getting stuff ready for readings or like submitting to papers or to journals and and festivals and and whatnot like there's definitely for me a lot of the motivating factor was like submitting to that stuff and like getting my work out there because one of the most rewarding things for me as a creator is like seeing how people react to the stuff I make so I think poetry actually taught me a lot about just like being able to separate myself from my work when I'm done and like wanting to like have something out there so that I can see you know how people are reacting to my work how I can grow in reaction to that um so yeah for me I think poetry taught me that a priority for me was like to really see how the audience engages with my stuff and to you know kind of try and learn something from that every time um and I definitely like took that into my games practice like I release a lot of small games like pretty quickly. <laughs> um, and I think that poetry kind of taught me to, to be okay with doing that. Huh. Do you ever, uh, do you ever hunger for a larger project? Obviously Tacoma is a multi-year yeah. investment that was significant. Um, do, do you think you'll continue to do this kind of work uh, in the future or do you really, is your, is your passion lie in sort of smaller personal games? Um, I think, I think about this a lot. I mean, obviously I'm like, you know, with Fulbright and like the experience of making Tacoma was like really, I would say both formative and just like transitional and just amazing. Working on Tacoma was one of the coolest things I've ever done in my life. So like, I would definitely do it all again, like this scale of project. And I would do something bigger, you know, if given the chance, like I said, right now, I'm not working on anything specifically. So I'm like, not super like doing that right now. Right. But it, something I think about a lot is how in my personal games work, especially, I'm always working on something really different. So I like to try to experiment with different genres. And even Tacoma was that for me. Like I'd never worked on a 3D game before I started working at Fulbright. So that was just like brand new design space for me. Um, and I think something that keeps me excited about making games is experimenting with different genres and just like super different mechanics and trying different stories and just, you know, I think it's, really like that's something I like to do but I see other really good designers who like to do the opposite who like to really like kind of experiment with a similar genre and kind of iterate on it and get really good at that one thing and I think that's awesome too mm. I think I kind of tried to do that with Lost Memories a bit because it's pretty similar to Sybil um, so I don't know I like to just try and keep it fresh so I'm always like excited about what I'm working on because I just hate being bored <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, you're not alone. Like, I have talked to other uh, game makers who who do side projects uh, while they're working. Really, they're always working on a big, like, uh, what you might consider an indie project, and then they have their own smaller project at night. Um, I almost never see this at big studios, presumably because there's like a, a contractual, um, there's a contract looming over you in the background of like, don't don't make games, you know, while you're here, uh, or there are ours. Uh, <laughs> but like, uh, I wonder um, what advice you would give other game makers who who are in the same boat you know like um put yourself back to where you were when you were joining fulbright you know when you're going over those interviews uh if you could give yourself any one piece of advice uh now what would it be mm -hmm. um hmm. i would say <laughs> like but the first thing that comes to mind is like super practical probably and like Great. so i'll give maybe two things one would be don't work on more than two games at once. <laughs> Just don't do it. Yeah, okay. I think that's good. I was good. working on three games or four games at once at one point during Tacoma's development, and it was a lot, and I was really stressed out. Um, and I think that that, I mean, I still like am really proud of the work that I did on those games, but I think I could have had a much more comfortable, like, like well paced development cycle for like my side stuff if I had been doing that. Um, or if I had, like, 
you know, limited myself to only a couple things at a time and take more vacations. I ha I have not taken enough vacations. So like, yeah, my best advice would be like, once you really feel like you're getting the stride of like making things, um, like be really deliberate about taking time off and about keeping the number of simultaneous projects low. Um, and then my more like advice to layer on top of that is don't be afraid to work on two things at once. Don't be afraid to take on side projects. Even if you're going to work on it really slowly over a long period of time, I think it's really healthy to have like something to take your mind off of like maybe your main project that's really stressing you out um, mm -hmm. and to have another creative outlet. So it's kind of like, it's definitely a hard thing to balance, but I think it's good to have like things to, different things to focus on when like one other thing is really like being a pain in the butt or stressing you out um but don't overdo it <laughs> yeah no i think it's really good advice and not nearly like when you said it's really practical i thought you were gonna say like invest in an ira like open a roth 401k <laughs> early <laughs> definitely talk to an accountant about that <laughs> uh so that's that's i think that's good advice and uh uniquely applicable to game makers uh maybe also all creatives in general like to you know take vacations uh but brian you had a vacation there a minute ago and now you're back how's it going <laughs> Good. I found out what happens when you when you have a setup that like makes the the worst bug that could happen ten times worse. That's what I. You get excited today. to see this cat. I love this cat. This is like. Yeah, I mean, I, our cat. I, not oh, to be your, rude to the. Yeah. Is it your cat? Uh, the cat in the game. Wait. Oh, is there a cat? Wait. Oh, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I, mean, I, didn't I have, see a, cat, this I have cat. a cat here too, but that my cat's, cat's name is Margaret Catwood. Yes. <laughs> Like, mm -hmm. It isn't in its like label, but there's things in the game where they're talking about the cat and they call it that. So yeah, that's the cat's name. <laughs> nice. Yeah, like I, I didn't want to jump in earlier, Brian, on your question, but like definitely, I feel like the works of Fulbright have been rife with references, nostalgic or otherwise. Like I definitely saw Roberta Williams earlier, and that was always a nice touch. Uh, I did not realize the cat's name was <laughs> Margaret Catwood. That's really really good. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, Brian. Sorry. Um, while you were away, did you? I, I feel like I've just sort of been rambling on here for a while. Did you have any like burning questions you wanted to get out there before we have to wrap this up? <laughs> you had to throw them before we wrap this up in there, didn't you? Um, oh, I mean, we got time. We got like fifteen minutes, but you know, no pressure, Brian. Um, um, uh, I guess yeah. Okay, yeah. Here's one that I was th in my from my notes that I was thinking today. So uh, Nina, you worked on this game as a level designer. You told us earlier about your career working on your own games as a game designer, independent game developer, you know, working with a few other friends. What would you say, like, sort of changed when you had to drill down into one area of the field and do this for one company? Like, like you're, you've had this career as, as a uh, academic-based independent artist, and now you have a career as, like, a contractor. kind Not a contractor, excuse me, that's what these people are. You're an employee doing one thing for a company like like how do you sort of reconcile that in your head mm -hmm. um for me it was just like a big learning experience and when i say that i mean that i was given the chance to work with steven carla and tyna and the other level designer and everyone else at fulbright and a lot of them you know for example Steve and Tynan, the other two level designers, Steve being my boss, um, they both worked on like Bioshock 2 together and have been doing level design for a really long time in this specific kind of like first person 3D game space. And like I mentioned earlier, I came from, I mean, Sybil, although Sybil, I argue, is a first person game, so maybe more similar than you'd expect, but I come from, you know, a very different design background. So becoming sort of able to work with these people full time for three years gave me the chance to like really learn a lot about level design in a way that I, I don't think I would have had access to otherwise, just by like having these mentors around, even though they're like my coworkers, once my boss, like I still, they're all mentors to me. And that sounds really like corny, but like, it's totally true. Like literally when I started at Fulbright, I had never used Unity and Tynan just sat with me every day and like taught me it. And so literally he mentored me in that sense, but also just being able to be a part of conversations about like, what does this space mean? Like when I'm drawing this paper map, what does that mean? And getting feedback on it and getting to work really closely with all these people just helped me learn so much um, about 
you know, the kinds of games that I really enjoy making, which is these narrative games, um, from a perspective that I didn't previously have access to just working sort of on my own with my friends um, who also weren't really in the industry or hadn't worked on larger scale games like a Bioshock or whatever before. So for me, it was like, wow, now I get to work with these amazing people who have totally different backgrounds from me and I can learn all this stuff from them. And it's awesome. <laughs> Nice. I question in the know. chat. Could you throw it out there, Alex, real quick? Yeah. So I was about to say, um, there's a question in the chat <laughs> that we should get to that kind of deals maybe with the business uh, mm -hmm. realities of being um, in your unique position, you know, in 2017, 2016, yeah. just the modern day. And that is that uh, Roman Lux wants to know are your personal small projects all your work, or do you outsource some parts? Or do you cooperate with somebody on those? So I guess I think we kind of have touched on this a couple of times from different angles, and I kind of want to know um, how do you uh, how do you how do you fund your own personal work? Is it all just help from friends and collaboration, or do you actually like reach out and get contractors? Like, how does it go? Yeah, it's been it's changed a lot over the years. Like with the early stuff, like how do you do it? We made that at Global Game Jam in three days, no funding, just four friends, you know, working on it. Um, so, like, I've done anything from that extreme to with, like, LostMemories.net. I got commissioned by the Manchester International Festival, and they gave me, you know, a budget that I could use to pay people to work with me on it. So for that game, um, which is sort of the other extreme end of the spectrum, I got to work with... Well, I've been working a lot with Aaron Friedman, who's been my collaborator on Lost Memories and Kimmy. Um, and we actually went to school together, which is how I know him. He's a really good programmer, really good game designer. And I was able to, you know, pay him to work on those projects with me as a, a like, really, really core collaborator. Um, and I was also able to, for Lost Memories, commission, like, seven or eight of my favorite artists to make art for the game, like, just sort of, like, standalone pieces um, for the websites in that game. Um, and I got to pay one of my favorite musicians, Eula, to do the music. So over the years, I've been able to sort of, like, work towards being in this position where I'm able to like get these commissions to pay people to work with me to do the stuff that I'm really bad at like making music drawing like illustration um and then you know Aaron working with me I do program and like I can do that stuff but it's really good to have a collaborator like him to sort of like you know bounce ideas off of and like if I don't have time because of Tacoma stuff he's still working on it so I really do work in a heavily collaborative sense and I am able to pay my collaborators now, which is really awesome and I think really important. Um, and, you know, but sometimes, you know, Aaron and I will probably now continue to work on stuff, even if, like, we'll probably try and do something maybe where I'm not getting commissioned. Maybe we just want to do something as friends. That stuff is still open to me, but I really have been lucky to get to do these commissions where I, like, have a budget to pay people. Um, but I kind of have functioned on that whole spectrum. Yeah, no, I think it's awesome. It's always nice to be able to pay your friends. Um, yeah good work uh and some but, of them, i didn't i didn't know you at all so like some of it was just like cold emails too so i've kind of tried to do like a variety of that stuff yeah it's even better when you turn your contractors into friends um so like <laughs> but we talk about collaboration and stuff and i want to know um maybe my most pressing question of the hour uh whose idea was it to put the body pillow in um, <laughs> that we saw back up here who modeled wizard marcus i mean oh, oh who modeled wizard Mar so all of One Vein was modeled by Emma Reese. Um, mm. Pretty sure her last, I'm blanking out on her last name, but she's Emma Reese on Twitter. I'm like, let me find her Twitter handle really quickly. Yeah, drop um, it in. yeah her Twitter handle is Emma Reese, A M A R I S S E. She's brilliant. I know her just from like, she works in the industry also. She's really awesome. And she agreed to, yeah, model our little, our little uh, boy band. Uh, she's brilliant. And the original, like, I can't even really remember. Like, the original idea came from, like, there was a joke in a video I did with Cara Ellison for Rock, Paper, Shotgun, where we were yelling about the one vein in this hentai game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was always, like, just a funny joke. And it came up in the office one day, and somehow that turned into a conversation about anime and boy bands. And then one vein was born. <laughs> um, so one vein was... Uh, kind of started as an inside joke that somehow kind of made its way to the game, which is actually a lot of things that's come up. You'd be surprised. A lot of inside jokes um, that became real things in the game. Um, but yeah, I actually built the, there's like a body pillow 
shopping page on Nat's desktop here um, in this area. And I got to like design that from scratch and like looked at lots of body pillow websites to like figure out what it should look like. And that was fun. So I got like my little anime reference in there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's good to hear it was a truly collaborative effort. Uh, yeah. uh, I should wonder as, as we sort of wrap up something that I've been meaning to ask since we started and I failed to is um, now with this project sort of behind you, you know, all wrapped up and completed. Um, how has it changed the way you look at other games? We were talking about, before we started, Prey, and what a cool game Prey is. I wonder, do you play that game differently now that you've spent so much time studying level design, level geometry, and the way stories are told through spaces, or not really at all? Oh, definitely a lot. Like, a lot differently. Mm. I mean, especially because, you know, like I've mentioned a bunch of times, I didn't work on 3D games before. To be honest, I, like, didn't even... Like, when I got hired at Fulbright, I told... I was talking to Steve, and he was like, have you played these games? And I was like, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> yep. I really grew up as, like, a JRPG, like, nerd, and so I played a lot of that stuff and, like, was really deep into MMOs and stuff. Mm. But I hadn't really ever been super into first-person 3D games, especially not shooters. And then when I started at Fulbright, Steve was like, okay, you have to play Half-Life 2, play The Last of Us, play um, Bioshock. And he gave me a whole, like, reading playing list or whatever of games um system shock 2 obviously uh sure, so yeah. i've really gotten educated in this genre um and now it's like you know my favorite genre <laughs> like i've gotten to work in it and now i'm able to really appreciate a lot of the detail that goes into stuff like prey mm -hmm. so when i was playing prey i my boyfriend and i played it together and we would like kind of swap off who's controlling and i just nerded out so hard the level design in that game is really incredible and I mean, they, yeah, they made something really special. I'll never forget, like, you know, the, just the view of walking into that garden area and seeing that guy's office, like, in that elevated building. Like, just that structure is really cool. And then the part where the guy has that whole, like, kind of VR, AR setup where he's thinking about his wife. That oh, is a really right. design. And so, yeah working on Tacoma and being educated in this genre of game and actually like building levels like the one you're in, like the layout of it, I'm just able to appreciate that stuff so much more. And I'm like the craft of it, like, it's like, you know, it's a lot of work. So I see the amount of work these people put into stuff like Prey and I'm just like, you are awesome. <laughs> nice. Uh, I, we keep going for another hour, but Brian, um, we should probably wrap up. Is there any final, final thoughts, final questions you want to slide in here? Um, if you were to, this is something I think I'm really excited to, you could talk to someone who has a academic, like, arts background, uh, with, how would you, if you, you know, sort of could describe your work as a level designer or a game designer the same way you describe your work as a poet, like, you know, sort of like, you know, like they were asking you to build a profile of your poetry in school, how would you think about your level design work that way? Is there a way you could sum up like the work you've done on Tacoma and other games? <laughs> well, just Tacoma, I guess. Sorry, a, a yeah. wee bit of a wee bit of the rambling there. No, it's okay. It's that's actually really hard because yeah, I get asked like you know I talk to people who aren't in don't work in games and stuff, and they'll be like, "What do you do? Like, what is a level designer? And what did you do on Tacoma?" I get asked this a lot, especially lately, and I'm. It's a really hard question to answer because, well, every level designer, I think at any studio, like, we're all, you know, there are some core things that probably a lot of us have in common, but honestly, depending on the game, it can be really different. And depending on, like, Fulbright's a small studio, so I feel like a lot of us wore a lot of hats during development. Like, I did a lot of scripting, a lot of, like, interactivity scripting. I did the original paper maps and like geo for these levels i did like i was part of like some narrative conversations like there was just a really wide spectrum of stuff that i worked on for tacoma so it's really hard to sum it up in one thing but usually what i say to people is like as a level designer i help figure out how to communicate story and character through spaces that are like navigable by players and that feel real and that feel lived in so really my focus whether i'm scripting something super simple like turning on a lamp to building like setting up the dinner table in in admin i'm always thinking like how can i make this experience for the player 
um, smooth enough that they can just take in the story at their own pace so that the game isn't getting in the way of them understanding who these characters are um, and so that the space feels real. So that's kind of like a complicated answer, but that's kind of like the best I can do given <laughs> the amount of hats that I wore. <laughs> yeah, right on. Um, still any more questions from the chat? I think there's one question we should address from our own Emma Kidwell saying, Hi, Nina, you're awesome. How do you respond? Emma is the best. <laughs> Emma We're, is. Yeah, she was in Portland recently. I miss her. <laughs> okay, how's the weather in Portland? It's like really hot, isn't it? Uh, well, actually, right now, right now, I'm in central Oregon, but Portland has been hellishly hot. <laughs> yeah. Mm. It was bad. And now I'm actually with the hanging out with the animator she's like in the other room i think doing something but yeah we're kind of like taking a little vacation so let's <laughs> so I have, I have a really important pressing and relevant question to this game design discussion which is that uh is ac common in portland because it's not in san francisco so yeah because i'm not originally from portland i'm like i lived in new york city for six years before this and you know it gets hellishly hot there too and i always had like one of those crappy like window acs just right next to my bed at all times because it gets so bad in, in New York. Um, yeah. But here, it had never really been that hot until like this summer. And I live and now live in like a top floor apartment in a house. So all the heat rises and I just cook in there. <laughs> but I do have an AC that came with the building. So, but it's like a standalone one. It's not very strong. So I don't know. I don't think that Portland's really ready for this. <laughs> I don't know. That's still huge. Like just the idea that just that anyone could conceive of an AC unit in a house. That is a huge step forward. Congratulations. That's very progressive. All right. I'm going to uh, need one second here to keep the game from crashing before we close up. So, uh, chat. Hmm? Huh? Oh, 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 <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought Brian was talking to people in chat. Um, so Nina, how's your day going? How's vacation? What do you, what do you do after you've shipped a game post? I'm back. Years. You don't have to chat anymore. Oh. Hi, okay. Hi. Unless you were chatting about something important. <laughs> I, yeah, it feels weird that the game's out. It doesn't even really feel real. Like, mm. I don't know. It's weird to work on something for three years and then have it suddenly people are playing it. People really like it, like, so I'm happy. <laughs> but it really doesn't even feel real yet. I think I still need some time to process, like, this game is, like, finished. And I'm not going to be, like, adding another room <laughs> or something next week oh, that's that's actually really interesting I, mean, I, I you know we do have to wrap this up but real quickly like so many developers talk about that postpartum depression um you ship a game and you just sort of feel yeah. this empty feeling sometimes even if it does really well and is successful um like i wonder how has how have your feelings about this game differed from the way you feel after releasing one of your own more personal projects if at all yeah. that's just definitely real i think for tacoma the weird part has just been like transitioning from working on Tacoma and all those side projects to like now I'm I really like have a little break where I'm not working on anything right the second I'm sure I'll start another thing like really really soon but just kind of trying to be like I can relax like I like I'm happy with how the game came out I'm really proud of it and just like I'm trying to remember like how to literally just like sit in my room and play Overwatch for like five hours straight. I'm like, I, I will feel okay about doing this. I won't feel lazy. <laughs> so for me, it's just like trying to like feel like I can relax. Cause you know, releasing a game is stressful. I think this was like a pretty low stress release for me, generally speaking, but it's still like an intense experience to put something that you worked so hard on for so many years out into the public. Um, it's definitely like a shock. Uh, so I'm kind of like still recovering from that and um, like going to go play Space Alert with my friends later and like probably drink some wine and be like, yeah, Tacoma came out. <laughs> Good. Excellent. <laughs> all right. I will commence uh, the wrapping up ceremonies. The, thank you all for watching another uh, um, technically challenged episode of the on the here with us on the gamma Sutra twitch channel um i've been joined today by okay. nina freeman as we play tacoma um uh it is now available on steam and xbox one if you want to check it out um nina if they have any questions for you about level design or indie indie development work where should they send them yeah um so you can always tweet at me uh i have i see a lot of notifications right now so i might not see it right away <laughs> but my Twitter handle is hentai PhD. 
Uh, and my website is Nina says dot so and my email address is there. So if you ever have questions, feel free to email me. Um, obviously, the Tacoma site is Tacoma dot game. Um, so you can check out stuff and links to where you can get it and whatnot. Um, but yeah, feel free to tweet at me. I'm a chatty gal. Hopefully, maybe I'll start streaming again soon. I was telling them earlier, I kind of want to stream Prey or something. So look out for that. I'm always up for chatting in Twitch streams and stuff too. So I'm very available. Cool. And uh, Alex, you, you, who are you again? Why, why are you? I don't even know, man. <laughs> who knows? I don't know. <laughs> Today, at least, I have been Alex Waro, editor at Gama Sutra. Thank you all so much for watching. And please have a fantastic uh, and uh, safe Wednesday. And I have been Brian Francis, a contributing editor at Gama Sutra. We would, as always, appreciate it if you would please follow the Gama Sutra Twitch channel so that uh, we can deliver to you more high quality interviews. Um, and hopefully, uh, we will, they'll be less problematic than this one. Sorry, that was actually partly my fault. Um, but yeah, uh, please follow so that we can get you more interviews, roundtables, the good stuff. If you like Gama Sutra, the website, you'll like Gama Sutra Twitch channel. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.